When I was a young evangelist, I connected with a couple guys in college, and we had a little trio singing group, preaching group. We all sang, we all preached, and we'd go. And the leader of the group had a sermon. He was big on titles. He loved these flashy, catch, phrase, hook-in-your-jaw titles. I've never been good on titles. Maybe it was because of that. I don't know. They have to help me with titles. I'll come up with the title, and they'll say, really? I mean, Rita does it to me all the time. They, they do me that way. But this guy had this title. And the title of this message, this sermon was, Get All You Can and Can All You Get. I don't know how to can. I've never canned anything, but we better learn the way things are going. You better, you better get around some of these old timers and young timers that know how and learn just in case because we don't know where we're headed. But get all you can and can all you get. Well, that's not what I'm preaching today. But there are some things that we need to get. We need to get it. There's some things we need to get in our spirit. There's some things we need to get in our, in our head. There's some things we need to get in our hand. And when we get those things, then we need to keep them. Some folks are good at getting, but they don't know how to keep anything. There are folks that made themselves millionaires two or three times, and then they'll lose it. They know how to get it. They don't know how to keep it. Look at your neighbor and say, get it and keep it. So I have a scripture. It's really a foundational scripture. It's a key. It's a key scripture that we ought to adhere to in life. It has to do with wisdom. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. I love this translation in the Amplified Version. There are many versions. There are good ones. But this one says, the beginning of wisdom is. Get wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is just get some. Get some wisdom. And then he says, skillfully and godly. Do it skillfully. Do it in a godly way. But get some wisdom. Because it is preeminent. Let me translate. You need it to live. <laughs> you need wisdom to live in this world. And then he said, and with all of your getting, all of your acquiring... Get understanding. Some folks have a lot of book learning, but they don't understand the practical how-to application. That's one thing I like about the school of lore. There are a lot of schools that you can go to and you can get all of your degrees. You can learn a whole lot of stuff. But when it comes to really doing the hands-on practical living, in ministry, in life, how to marry, bury, baptize, cast out devils, walk on the water, move the mountains, and slay the giants. They don't know nothing about that. That's what we're going to train you to do in the school of roar. We're going to help you to find your roar, to get your roar back if you lost your roar, and then release the roar. So with all of your acquiring, get some understanding. Actively seek spiritual discernment. Let me say that again. Actively seek spiritual discernment. Mature comprehension. And logical interpretation. Let me translate it in East Tennessee vernacular. You need walking around sense. You need to learn how to get out of the rain when it's raining. If you're sitting on a tack, don't just sit there and howl like a, 
old hound dog on the front porch. Get up, remove the tack, and thus the pain will subside. Yes, sir. I'm talking about walking around, getting out of the rain, practical, everyday living, good sense. That's what we need. We need to get wisdom. So let's talk about some of the things that we really need to give if we have wisdom or get if we have wisdom. Number one, we need to get saved. Foundational, basic principle in life. We live in a Christian nation. Some folks would say we don't anymore, but yeah, we do. There's more of us than there are of them. The enemies just don't want you to know how many of us there really is. But being born in this nation doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. Don't work that way. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you have to repent. You have to say, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. And ain't none of us perfect. You might be pretty good. But unless you've repented and invited him into your heart, you're still a sinner. We are sinners only saved by grace. So Acts 3.19 says, repent of your sins. Repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. It's very simple. Let's do it right now. Say, Jesus, Jesus. I'm a sinner. sinner. Forgive me me. for for all of my sins. Come into my heart. And from this day forward, be the Lord of my life. And when I mess up, I will get up. But I need your help. I'm trusting you as the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or in repentance, in rededication, if you said it from your heart, even though you were repeating words that I asked you to say, if you said them from your heart, God saved you. It's that simple. But he wants us to get saved for real. When you really get saved, you change. Everything changes. It's a process. But some things are immediate. Immediately, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is on you. And when you start going back to the old way of life and doing the the old things and going to the old places and doing all the things that you used to do, immediately the Holy Spirit quickens your heart and it's like, it don't feel just right. Maybe I don't need to do this anymore. And when you really get saved, that's what happens. So get saved for real and then keep on living right after you get saved. Let me give you a little heads up. Just because you prayed at vacation Bible school when you were nine years old, if you ain't been living for him all those years, you're probably not saved. That's the first step. We just prayed together a, a confession of repentance. That's the first step. After that, you start living for him. You, you get saved for real and then you keep Living right. Proverbs 11.3. The integrity and the moral courage of the upright will guide them. But the crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. So when you get really saved, he will guide you. He will lead you. You will want to live right. You may mess up. You may stumble and fall. But you will want to keep going forward. You want to get up. Dust yourself off. Say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Help me. I'm going to do better tomorrow. And you keep going forward. So get saved for real and then keep living right. And then get your time with God. You need time with God. I need time with God. We all need time with God. The two hours on Sunday morning is not enough. Don't shout me down. The two hours on Sunday morning, these are the moments that we come together to celebrate what God has been doing all week long, the last six days. This is celebration time. It's it's rejoicing time. It's testimony time. It's praise God time. And he has blessed us. So we ought to get the time with God every day. We need time with him every day. I've been married to Rita for years. And if, if I don't spend time with her, the relationship will, will get broken. 
She expects some time with me. I expect some time with her. Sometimes it seems like all we do is work, work, work. Even though we are working together. But we need time with each other. So real soon, we're going to disappear. We're going on a vacation. Bye, y'all. See, some of them know they are, they are clapping for us. But we need time with God. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. One translation says, Study to show yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Why? Because he is rightly dividing the word of God, the word of truth. So we need our time with God. Hebrews 4.15 said, said, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. We need help in the time of need. So get time with God and keep your time with God a priority. You can get a few moments with him, but if, it, if it's not a priority with you, it's easy to let a day go by and not spend time with him. The next thing you know, a week's gone by and you've not spent any time with him. And you missed on Sunday, so you didn't even get the few moments here. And then two weeks have gone by. Then a month has gone by. And the next thing you know, you are backslidden away from God, out of church. You're not reading your Bible. You're not praying. And you find yourself cold spiritually because you got away from the fire. The closer you stay to the fire, the more on fire you are you need time with God and then you need to get connected in his house because a church was God's plan the church the church the church of Jesus Christ on planet earth was God's plan denominations might have been man's idea but the church is God's idea We are non-denominational. We are connected to Jesus. We have fellowship and network with others. We believe in other churches. We pray for them. We love them. And when you find somebody else, another church, another pastor of like faith, pray for them. We pray for them. We pray for this city. We pray for churches. But the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, we must not quit meeting together as some people are doing. Oh, I heard what you said. Well, that doesn't apply for COVID. No, 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 no. That's not what it said. It says we must not quit meeting together as some are doing, regardless of COVID, regardless of the plague, regardless of of a law that says you can't have a church service anymore and they lock you up. It doesn't matter. There are underground churches around the world that I have been to. I've smuggled Bibles into China because they couldn't have one if they, they, there was no place to buy them and they had underground secret churches and we planted some secret churches in Vietnam and we've planted secret churches in China. Because the Bible says we must not quit meeting together. As some are doing. No, we need to keep on encouraging each other. This becomes more and more important as you see the last day. That's what he's talking about. As you see the day getting closer. The last days. He said in Timothy, in the last days, peerless times would come. Difficult times, difficult days where men will be lovers of themselves, coveters, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy, truth breakers, incontinent, fierce, heady, high minded, traitors, lovers of self. Uh oh, more than lovers of God. Read it. First Timothy three. Read it. It's there. It describes our culture now. We are living in the selfie generation. Luke 4, 16 says, Jesus traveled to Nazareth, the town where he grew up. On the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue as he always did. And he stood up to read. If Jesus went to church, don't you think we should? Let's fill this place. Let's fill this house. Let's tell our family, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers. We've got signs out there. We've got bumper stickers. We've got all kinds of things. We've got cards that you can give anonymously. You can walk up to a stranger, let of the Holy Ghost, put it in their hand. Don't even open your mouth. Just give it to them and walk away. Let God do the work. Let the Holy Spirit touch them. 
Go buy somebody's tank of gas the next time you're at the gas station. You see somebody, look around and say, Lord, who do I need to help? And just find somebody. Go over there and fill their tank with gas and give them a little card. Come to Metro Tab. Oh, it got quiet right there. I heard what you said. Yeah, you're, you're driving your lawnmower to church because it gets better mileage, right? Get connected to his house. Keep your connection to this house a priority because this is where we pray for you and we cover you. Not to say you can't pray for yourself. I, I understand. And husbands, you should be the priest of your house covering your house. But when there's a problem, when there's a need, you call on us. We're on call 24-7. Yes, sir. We come at 3 or 4 in the morning, whatever time it is, if there's an emergency. Somebody will call you. Somebody will pray with you. Somebody will show up with you. I've done it all my ministry. Come on. I love T.D. Jakes, but he ain't coming to your house. I love Billy Graham, but he never went to your house. Come on, somebody. They're not coming. I'm your pastor. You're in this house. Be a part of this house. Get connected to this house. Your healing, your destiny is connected and tied to this house. I better move on before I get in trouble. Get right relationships. You need right relationships. Not just relationship, right relationship. Some folks are so hungry to have a relationship, they settle for wrong relationships. Wrong relationships will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than you want to pay. You need right relationships, godly relationships, holy relationships. You need to be connected of people with people of like faith. People that believe the Bible, they know what the Bible says. Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks as a companion with wise men, we just talked about that in the first scripture, with wise men will be wise. Hang around wisdom. Hang around wise people. Hang around godly people. Your relationships ought to be spent hanging out with people that are men and women of God. The rest of the scripture says, but the companions of conceited, dull-witted fools are fools themselves and will experience harm read it in any translation you want to read it in this is what it says you hang out with fools you ain't nothing but a fool fool don't get mad at me it's right there on the screen he who walks as a companion with wise men will be wise hang around with wise people men and women of God and it will affect you but The companions of conceited, dull-witted fools are fools themselves, and they will experience harm. So get right relationships. Keep them. If somebody turns out to be a Judas, bless them on the way out the door. That's right. Let it go, let it go, let it go. If I could sing, I would sing. Let it go, let it go. Get a generous heart while you're getting things. Get a generous heart. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be stingy. Look back at him and say, don't be greedy. Get a generous heart and keep on giving. Proverbs 28, verse 27. Those who give to the poor will lack nothing. Did you read that? Did you read that? Do you believe this book? Did you know that was in there? If you give to the poor, it didn't say they would lack. It said you would lack nothing if you give to the poor. Those who give to the poor will lack nothing. But those who close their eyes to the poor, those who close their eyes, to them receive many curses. You know who closes their eyes to the poor? Greedy folk. Stingy folk. Folks that think there's not enough to go around, that God doesn't have enough, that he can't get it to you. But the Bible says if you give, you won't lack. If you give, if you are generous, 
The Bible says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Y'all ain't shouting me down. Why aren't y'all shouting me down? You know, some of y'all know it's right. Some of you know it's true. You have experienced giving and seeing God give it back and multiply and bring increase into your hand. It is a cycle. The more you give, the more comes back to you. When you stop giving, it stops coming. It just cuts off. But when you give, when you are generous, when you pay your tithes and you give an offering and then you give to others... Watch it come back. Watch it increase. Another scripture, Luke 6, 38 says, when you give to others and you will receive, give to others and you will receive, you will be given much. It will be poured into your hands more than you can hold. You will be given so much that it will spill into your lap. The way that you give to others is the way God will give to you. Why do we find it so hard to give? Why do people shut down when a preacher starts talking about giving and money? God's not trying to get it from us. He's trying to get it to us. And this is the method. This is the way. This is the plan. This is the process. This is the sample. This is the direction. This is the method that God gave us to get resources into our hand. Give it away. It's a seed. When you put a seed in the ground, how many of y'all plant tomatoes this year? Let me see. Any tomato? I know we got, I got a few. All right. If you planted tomatoes, you're putting seed in the ground. Do you do that just because you want to play in the dirt and you don't expect anything from it? No. You are expecting something to come back. And if you put one seed in the ground and you only got one tomato, you might as well kept what you had. But when you put one seed in the ground and you get a plant and you start seeing little green tomatoes on it and then they start turning red and they start getting bigger and the multiplication takes place out of one seed, you understand the principle of God sowing and reaping harvest. When you sow, you will reap. He calls it, watch this now, he calls it seed, time, and harvest. So sow a seed, wait for the time, and receive the harvest. And if the time seems to be too long of a span, then you need more seed in the ground. Put seed in the ground every day. If you got seed in the ground every day, down here you're going to start getting seed off or harvest off of the first seed. Then you're going to get some off the second seed. Then you're going to get some off the third seed. And if you keep sowing while you are receiving, the cycle starts multiplying. You start getting more than you can handle. You can't hold it all. That's what the Bible says. You can't hold. People are going to bring it and put it in your hand. It's going to overflow in your lap. You're not saying nothing. You know it's the truth. You know it's work. It's the, it's the reason this country is the most blessed country on the planet Earth. Because we have given. We have sowed. We've given food. We've given resources. We've given everything to people all over the planet. And God has blessed us. And when we start doing this and doing this, he can't get it back to us. We've got to do it like this. We give we keep our hands open, our arms open to receive. That way, you give to others. The way that you give to others is the way God will give to you. So get generous. Get a generous heart and keep on giving. Oh, here's a little side note. We do believe in tithing. We believe it's a biblical principle. Somebody said, oh, it was Old Testament. Uh-huh. Go back before the law. When Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek before the law. And he was a type of Christ. And then go to the scripture I gave you a few moments ago where Jesus went to the temple and stood up to read. If Jesus had not been a tither, don't you know the Pharisees and the Sadducees would have crucified him sooner? They didn't say anything about him not being a tither. Oh, it's quiet now. So... We believe in tithing. We are a family of tithers. We give above and beyond. We give our tithe. We pay our tithe. We give an offering. And we are blessed kingdom partners. We are difference makers. We believe in the Bible, which the, includes the Old and the New Testament. Contrary to what a popular TV preacher who will remain mainless, nameless, but something about him has to do with dollar. And just this past week, he denounced tithing 
after teaching it for 40 years. So that's why I put a little side note up here. It says, we believe in tithing. Amen. Look at somebody and say, tithing works. tithing works. And then we need to get accountability. Oh, this is a good one. Some folks don't want to be accountable. They don't want to be accountable. They want to do their own thing. Let me call a thing a thing. Get accountable. It's a good book, by the way. You need to get a copy of it today. Get accountable and then keep on living accountable. 1 Corinthians 4.15. For even if you were to have 10,000 teachers to guide you in Christ, you would not have many fathers who led you to Christ and assured, assumed responsibility for you. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the good news of salvation. Though you have 10,000 instructors, you don't have many fathers. If you can find a true spiritual father, you better get accountable, become accountable to that father. Yes, sir. And keep on living accountable. Amen. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Be accountable. We need to be accountable to one another. And then we need to be consistent. Get consistent. Quit being double minded. Quit riding the roller coaster of life with your emotions. God created us with emotions, but He also gave us a head, He gave us a spirit. We live in a body. So we need to be consistent on our journey every day. I understand emotions. I understand. You wake up, you open the windows, you look out, and the sky is blue, and it's a beautiful day, and the temperature is 75 degrees, and you live on the beach in the ocean, and you got $2 million in the bank, and you're happy. And then the next day, you wake up, and it's storming, and it's raining, and you live in the hood, and you ain't got two nickels to rub together. Oh, come on. And you can't pay your bills and you're about to be evicted. And so because of your circumstances, you're ready to blame God, to quit God. When the truth is, the one in the hood's probably living closer to God than the one on the beach with $2 million in the bank. But people are emotional. And I've seen rich people and poor people with problems. Now, if you're rich and got problems, poverty is not the answer. You get that in a little bit. But consistency, consistency is your key. Scripture, James 1. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone, not in the two million dollars. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Somebody say double-minded. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. Quit being unstable. Put your trust in him, in God alone, and do not waver. Put your trust in him and what he says in this book to you and about you. And quit being an unstable, double-minded, spiritual schizophrenic. Thank you very much. I probably ought to just go on past this one. I'll give y'all time to read it. Because everybody's got their head down. They don't want to read it. Get past the excuses. Because everybody's got one. Everybody can come up with one. There's plenty of, there's plenty of excuses that we can all make. 
why we hadn't done this or why we're not doing this or why we're not where we ought to be. Get past the excuses and keep on pushing to a higher level. Simple scripture. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to memorize Philippians 4.13. Quit being an I can't person. I teach our kids, our grandkids, we are I can people. We are not I can't. Don't tell me you can't. Don't tell me you can't. We can do anything we want to do in Jesus' name. Because the Bible says, I can do everything through Christ who gives me the strength. I can do everything through Christ who gives me the strength. I can, say it with me, I can do everything through Christ who gives me the strength. Again, I can do everything through Christ who gives me the strength. Get past your excuses and keep on pushing to a higher level. And then get the victory, keep the victory. Get the victory and keep the victory. You see, if you get saved and you get right with God and you spend time with him and you become generous and you keep on pushing, you're going to get the victory. When you get it, keep it. It's easier to keep it than it is to get it. Romans 8. In all these things, in all of life, in everything you go through, every storm, every victory, every mountain, every challenge, every win, every loss, whatever, in all of these things, we as Christians, we, the people of God, we are more than conquerors. And we gain an overwhelming victory through him who loved us so much that he died for us. We are conquerors. We are overcomers. Get the victory. I often ask people, you got the victory? You got the victory? You love Jesus? You ready to take over? Because that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to take over every arena, every area of the world. We should be the best in the family. We should be the best in the economy. We should be the best in entertainment. We should be the best in education. We should be the best in all of these things. They call them the seven mountains. We are more than conquerors through him. And we gain an overwhelming victory through him who loved us. So get the victory. Keep the victory. Look at your neighbor and say, I got the victory. Would you stand? We have just crossed the threshold of the halfway mark for 2022. Just a few days ago, 10 days ago, I guess. Is today the 10th? So 10 days ago, the end of June was the halfway mark. For 2022. Now, here we are looking at a new quarter, a second half. Some sports teams get the reputation of being a second half team. I don't know, I don't know what you are, but if you didn't get it all together in the first half, you have the second half to get it to get it right to keep it to get all you can and can all you get get it and keep it but you know we have to if we get wisdom then we get it when you get wisdom you have what I call Aha moments, frequently. Every time you read your Bible, something will jump out at you. And it's like, wow, I've never, I never saw that before. I never saw it just like that. It's like, aha, that's what he was saying. That's, that's what he meant. That's what he's teaching me. I hope you had a few aha moments during this message as we talked about what we need to get and keep. Now, when it comes to our finances, we need to give those away. Give away. Give it away. And the more you give away, the more comes back. 
And unless God says specifically to give that particular part away when it comes back, a portion of everything that comes into your hand is yours to keep because we are stewards. He wants us to steward those things that he places in our hand. He trusts us with those. So we can all, listen carefully, we can all increase our capacity to be better stewards. We can all do that. And it's a process. But the beautiful thing about relationship with God is after every level, there's another level. After every level, you get to the place you think, man, look how far I've come. Thank God. But you can go higher with him. You can go to the next level with love. You can go to the next level with anointing. You go to the next level with faith. You can go to the next level with miracles. Everything in this book, he's got another level. We never arrive. We just get peace in our heart. We get that right relationship. And he's got another level, another blessing, another touch, another breakthrough, another miracle for all of us. I hope you're on the journey. I hope you continue on the journey. I hope you get it. And then decide I'm going to keep it. Give away your faith. You know the only thing we can take to heaven? The only thing you can take to heaven is family and friends. That's all. You can't take your millions of dollars, your best-selling books, your best songs, your best music. All you can take are your family and your friends. And if you love somebody, we better do everything we can to get them saved and on this journey with us. Does that make sense? Lift your hands. I want to pray for you. Father, as we have just crossed the threshold into the second half, help us to get it. Help us to get that wisdom, that walking around sense, that practical hands-on every day living for you, regardless of the storms and the challenges. Help us to get that kind of faith, that kind of wisdom. Pray for every person under the sound of my voice right now. I pray for your peace, for your presence, for your anointing. I just praise you. We thank you. I pray for impartation, Lord, of your word, of your truth. I pray that the faith that you have given me through my heritage, through family and friends, and through the relationships that have been developed over my lifetime, I pray that you would anoint me to impart that faith to these people as pastor as shepherd I pray that faith would begin to rise in this house I pray that this house would begin to be such a vibrant body of believers of faith of your word that nothing is too difficult and we know that we have the aha moment and we begin to bring family and friends that are sick that are broken that are struggling that are that have regressed, that whatever their circumstances, because we know if we can get them here, the faith in the house that they will connect with will change their life, will radically transform them, and we will see our family and our friends saved and sanctified and filled with your Holy Ghost, healed and delivered and restored. We'll see miracles. We'll see breakthroughs like never before with our family, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers. Anoint us, O God. Let that faith resonate in our spirit right now. Like rumbling Niagara's, let faith resonate in our spirit. Let us sense right now who you are and what you will do as we give you praise. We worship you. We bless you. I bless these that are here. I bless those watching online and those watching through TV. We we bless them in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray right now for the power of your spirit to touch every person. Every person. Now one more time, just lift up your hands and worship him and begin to receive it. Just receive right now. These last few moments, just 
Just receive, receive, receive healing, receive breakthrough, receive, receive wisdom. Receive it, receive it, receive it now in Jesus' name.